not be one of them. So as I begin, I want you to know that I'm coming from that perspective, that understanding. Anyway, as we continue to experience the word of the Lord together, let us turn to Acts. Listen. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chair. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The grass withers, the cloud falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. I'm aware that uh, the weather is a little colder than this. In fact, I'm aware that y'all did not gather last week, but for just a minute, go with me. I hate the cold, so go with me as we imagine summer, and maybe it's vacation. Will you go with me? Let's go to a warm, happy place. As long as we're on summer vacation, let's imagine everything's perfect. You're, you're young, in your prime, maybe even better looking than you remember yourself from school, okay? You get to go, <laughs> you get to go to the beach. You even maybe meet someone, someone sweet, cute, dreamy, whatever you're into. A little summer romance is just sometimes just the thing, right? So you go back to reality, you tell your friends, of course, about your summer events. Of course, you're going to mention the summer romance, your friends want details, so you share some of them. And then while singing the praises of summer, you run into that summer romance. Now they are at your school, beginning to make friends with some of your friends. And if all those things happen, it might just start giving you chills. They might even start multiplying. <laughs> yeah, we're talking Greece here. The movies are good at making it seem like there's only one way things can happen. That destiny and our fate is pulling every string. Events could happen only one way. Or maybe that's just me. I'm, I do that with movie and TVs. I want to interject free will. This is not something I'm proud of. I was the person in the movie theater yelling at the screen, Leo, don't get on that boat. <laughs> and then telling Captain Smith, don't take those orders to go faster. And then yelling to the boat, it said, turn left, turn left. Finally, somebody sitting next to me had to say, you are aware that the boat is going to hit that iceberg. It is, you've heard of the Titanic, yes? I then started to yell, Leo, take acting lessons. But, you know. <laughs> I think we 
like to look back at the past and say, it's the only way it could have happened. But in reality, the past is just the way things did happen. It's the old debate. Is fate doing the work or is there free will? The reality is, I don't think it matters. Good or bad, the past is unchangeable. What is changeable is the present and the future. If you haven't figured out, I'm not a big believer in fate or destiny. I don't think God is pulling all the strings on events, small or big, to make things happen. Which is not to say that I believe everything that happens is all random. I believe there is a bunch that is random, but I, I do believe that we have control over what we experience. How we react to events, both random and less random, random, determines much of our lives. So I'm not going to tell you that Philip was moved by God to be in a certain place at a certain time because God was pulling all of his strings. Instead, I think it was fortuitous that Philip was in a spot where there was need, and he was ready to act. And because he did, some really amazing things happened. A lot of amazing things, actually. Sure, some of them seem obvious, but look beneath it. And I'd be the first to say that baptism of a new believer is nothing short of the miraculous. I think there's some, also some other things that are equally amazing going on. A foreigner is treated with respect and as an equal. A conversation between two people of different race happen politely. Two people from different backgrounds and religions freely exchanged ideas without any report, shouting, screaming, violence, which is, was as much a big deal then as it would be today. An impromptu religious thing happened, and the participants left rejoicing, not complaining about how long the sermon was, or that they didn't like the hymns because they didn't recognize them, or that the liturgy didn't apply to them. Talk about your miracles. <laughs> All of those things happened, as well as the conversion and baptism, because Philip found himself in a place where he could be useful, and he acted faith. is bandied about in the Christian tradition is it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. As in no matter how dark it feels today, it can be as dark as Good Friday, but the resurrection and the light therein always follows. Today I say it's Sunday, but Friday's coming. This is the last Sunday before we remove elect from President elect Trump on Friday. I'm not going to get political. If you wanted to hear some wonderful political sermons, you should have been here at 11. If you were, you were treated. I'm going to presume that I'm not the first to tell you tensions have been high <laughs> since well before election. And they've remained high after. On the liberal side, protests have not always been peaceful. Folks with Trump stickers on their cars have been harassed or even pulled out of their cars and beaten up. On the other side, folks have grabbed women, said racial slurs at people, and threatened the kind of violence that President-elect Trump has said now to stop. Tension isn't going to stop on Friday. About a third of my church will not be in attendance next Sunday. They're headed up to Washington, D.C. for a march for people who want women's voices heard and their rights protected. I'll be attending the march on Saturday in Atlanta so that I can be at church the next day for those that don't make the trip. 
This is the time for the church to be the church. This is the time for the church to stand up and say violence and division is not the answer. This is the time for the church to stand up for people who are afraid that their rights are going to go away. This is the time for the church to speak up for Muslim people, for refugees, for people from Mexico, for people from every nation, for people of every race, not just white people, for the LGBTQ community, for women, for every single person, especially those that others would marginalize or minimalize. Brothers and sisters, this is the time for the church to be the church. You all have history with that. Don Steele wanted to move into this presbytery and become a member of this presbytery. I heard from the moderator of your presbytery the struggle that he was having, wanting for that, not for Don Steele to be voted in, but pretty sure he wouldn't be. If you're unaware, you're installing that former moderator right now. You know what happened. The presbytery said no. You aren't allowed to be a member here or allowed to labor in our bounds, is what this presbytery was. You said yes anyway. You took someone in the presbytery who was willing to marginalize and minimize. And you said, not on our watch. I don't know you well yet, but I've been a minister of the Word Sacrament for 17 years. I'm proud of you. It's Sunday. Friday's coming. You're going to have to do more of that. You are here. I don't know if you're Philip or the Ethiopian eunuch or what in this story. Usually we think of you as the donkey, but there's no donkey in this
Church of Jesus Christ, a sign in the world today of the new life that God intends for all. In our life together, we are to be a living embodiment of the ministry of Jesus Christ, working for the reconciliation and community, seeking to break down walls that divide us from one another. As the living body of Christ, the church is called to proclaim the good news and to demonstrate Christ's love and service to the world. We are called to undertake this mission even at the risk of life, trusting God in all things. In faith, we embrace a new openness to what God is doing in our time, a renewed obedience to follow in the work taught to us by Jesus Christ, and a new joy in our common worship and work. Today we reclaim our historic calling and remember the great ends of the church, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The ministry of the church is shared by pastors and people, so that all together may fulfill the mission to which we are called in Jesus Christ. The particular responsibility of the ministry of word and sacrament is to build up the church and serve the people of God so that the word may be rightly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly celebrated. In his baptism, Brian was clothed in Christ. He was ordained to the ministry of word and sacrament by Trinity Presbytery and is now called by God through the voice of this church 
to serve as pastor of this congregation. The call to this ministry has been extended by the congregation, accepted by the candidate, and approved by the Presbytery. Therefore, the Presbytery of Holston, by means of this commission, now installs Brian Wyatt as pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Elizabethan, Tennessee. We remember with joy our common calling to serve Christ, and we celebrate God's call to our brother to serve among us as pastor. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do, and I will. Will you be a minister of the word and sacrament in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by our confessions? I will. Will you be governed by our church's <laughs> polity, and will you abide by its discipline Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? I will. Will you be a faithful minister, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will. We now live in a world where intimacy is treated as a commodity. And we live in a world where authenticity is a marketing strategy. Yet, Brian, in this ancient tradition, in this enacted prayer, we again encounter a God who is at work in our community, who brings us intimacy and authenticity through the mystery of prayer and the communal nature of our very God. I've known you a long time. I've known members of this congregation even longer. I think I got kicked out of the Boy Scouts right downstairs. <laughs> Across the street, I got paddled in junior high, and one of the teachers here helped prevent me from being expelled at the high school just down the street. All of my best heresies I inherited 
from the minister's wife when I was a teenager. <laughs> I cannot imagine a better congregation or a better minister to be put together, be it fate, God pulling the strings, or free choice, it's clear to me the spirit and the mystery of God at work in this day. Would you kneel now and face this, your new congregation? What we do here is a mystery, but it's also an act of faith. And so I would invite all of the members of the commission and all the folk who are ordained to ministry of word and sacrament or teaching or ruling elder to come forward now and place your hands either upon Brian or upon someone else's shoulders. As we voice and embody this prayer, may we all be reminded that grace and goodness, that holiness and possibility are being enacted in our midst that God's goodness comes from our very selves. Don't be afraid to get from them unless people see them. <laughs> They're going to see plenty of Brian, so just go ahead and walk him in. That's fine. to you who are here, lay your thoughts and your joy and your love upon this, your new pastor. Let us pray. Name above all names, name yet untamed, pull us together to the heart of this moment that we might know again your spirit is at work among us. Pull us together that the gifts, the leadership, the love that Brian brings might intertwine with and enrich the life and the ministry of this most welcoming and needed community. Pull them together, that they might stand before your mystery with a steadfast love and a holy impatience for the goodness and grace you intend for the world. And having pulled them together, take them out beyond holiness, out beyond ideas of who is in and who is out, out beyond notions of sacred and profane, to see again your image within each one of us, to again feel your pulse at the heart of all creation. Take them out to the crossroads of our broken and beautiful world where soldiers curse and nations clash. Take them out as your hands and feet to be witness that healing and love are still at work in our world, are still alive in our hearts. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Brian, if you would stand. Brian, as minister of word and sacrament in the Church of Jesus Christ, you are now installed as pastor of this congregation. God help us all, and God continue to bless us. <laughs> so as you said to me, be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the life, the ministry, and the truth and mystery and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Through lots 
of praying and paperwork and patience, you and you have decided to enter into a relationship with one another. A relationship that will sometimes be messy and sometimes be joyful, and one that will always, always be holy. To be completely honest with you all, I've seen Brian in some pretty tough spots. <laughs> when I was in high school, Brian had the immense privilege of serving as an advisor at Colston Presbyterian Youth Council, <laughs> of which I was a part. Uh, I remember one particular Presbyterian Youth Retreat that happened sometime in the winter. We all went into, into a church member's oversized SUV and headed over the mountains to Holston Camp. There you go. Um, <laughs> thanks to some persistent badgering for the back seat full of country high schoolers, we eventually stopped at McDonald's. And in his infinite wisdom, <laughs> Brian decided to try and place eight separate orders at a drive-thru. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, you can imagine the anxiety that ensued for your new, beloved, type A pastor. <laughs> I think we pulled out of the parking lot maybe 45 minutes later, uh, none of us had what we ordered. Um, and that ordeal kind of set the tone for the rest of the weekend. It was great. Um, but one thing that stands out for me from that entire is that periodically, amid the keynotes and the recommends and the general insanity that is a high school youth retreat, I would go up to Brian and tap him on the shoulder and say, Preacher, breathe. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. He never believed me. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, six-ish years later, um, and Preacher, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing. <laughs> These are your people now, and this is your place. The Holy Spirit is going to do what she does. It's going to get hectic, messy. It's going to be full and fun and fabulous. And no matter which extreme you find yourself experiencing on any given day, breathe. God is here in this place, in these people, and in you. The air is literally full of love. A kind of love that shoves you out from behind this pulpit and out the doors at the back of the a boundless, unpredictable love is in this air. Breathe it in. But I have to tell you, it's not going to be fine. <laughs> you haven't been called here for just fine. You've been called here for so much more. And of course, there will be the proverbial SUV full of hungry high schoolers <laughs> every now and then. But the end result of all the work, the late nights and the hospital visits and the Saturday night sermons, will be the holy relationship earlier. The kind that gives you life. The kind of life that is full of deeply good news. So preacher, love these folks. I can tell they already love you. Cry with them and hope with them. Challenge them and let them challenge you. Figure out what it looks like to do church here in all its mess and wonder and chaos. Embrace how beautiful and scary that is. You know how to serve with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. I'm not in the least bit worried about that. Just don't forget to breathe. It's going to be great. I am from out of town, so I do bring you greetings. <laughs> from the Presbytery of Arkansas, and uh, in a couple weeks from the Presbytery of Mississippi, where I'll be going but also from an extended family of people who don't know Brian personally, but have a large investment in him, because there's so many of us who have an investment in his ministry and his life. Brian asked me this morning to charge the congregation. So I thought the best way to start that was to 